I started this course by trying to briefly explain what philosophy is. And I noted that there are two main ways of trying to do that. One is to give some brief characterization of the field, or even a more detailed explanation of what people in that field do. That is what I have been doing throughout this course. I have explained what philosophy is, what philosophers do, and what subjects they discuss, and so on. But in the beginning I noted that there is another way of explaining what philosophy is. And that is by giving a historical overview of how it came to be and how it developed. It is my intention to make a whole course about the history of philosophy someday. But here I will try to give only a very brief historical overview of philosophy. I include in the following timeline some history that is not even directly related to philosophy to remind you of what sorts of things were happening at various times and what must have influenced the thinking of philosophers at the time as well. My main source for this history is Svante Nordin's great book on the history of philosophy, translated to Finnish by Jukka Heiskanen as Philosophian Historia, Länsimaisen järjen seikkaut talesta postmodernismiin. The original title is Philosophy's Historia. It's the best uh, book on the history of philosophy that I have read so far. My original intention was to make just one video about the history of philosophy, but that doesn't seem to be possible for me. I ended up with almost 25 pages of dense notes, which is far too much for a single video. So I will do something different for a change. I have actually been writing a book uh, for this video series, so I will include these notes in the book. And now I will just go over some parts of my notes. Some general comments about these notes first. There are no ages or eras in objective reality. Such things are inventions of historians who frequently have to choose how to define and redefine such concepts to fit their purposes. In the following, I, for the most part, follow ordinary conventions regarding them, but have made some decisions of my own. The dates for the lifetimes of the various philosophers are not always exact. For example, the year of birth is not always known, even if an apparently specific year is given here. I provide some very superficial notes on the philosophical thinking of each era, and... Uh, of the individuals mentioned. Many more people could have been included, but this is supposed to be just an introduction to the subject, so I hope you'll accept my limited choices. But also, do let me know in the comments below uh, who or what you think I should have included. Women are especially underrepresented here. The structure of this history section uh, will be as follows. The first, this video, will uh, cover the whole of antiquity. The second video will cover the Middle Ages and the Age of Renaissance and Reformation. The third video will be about the early modern and modern periods. The fourth and last will revisit contemporary philosophy, as it is called, as I already made a video about it. But this one will be significantly different, as you will see. I will also include a summary of philosophy at the very end of that video. So, here are the notes. Our story begins in the 6th century BCE, before Common Era, in classical antiquity. And uh, this period of history in this part of the world, eastern part of the Mediterranean, is where philosophy, as we know it, began to emerge in city-states, where people, for example, owned slaves. That is important because this means that some people at least had leisure time, the opportunity to choose how to spend their time. They didn't have to just 
toil, the land or whatever. Uh, this culture used to be very aristocratic and it still was, but there was a change going on at this time. Uh, commerce, uh, trade, even uh, over long distances, really started to import various ideas, for example, and that's important. Uh, in general, the mixing of different cultures that was going on is important. New ideas, ways of thinking, new religions, that sort of thing uh, was coming to the consciousness of the people, especially the rich ones or the people who had free time. And there was uh, also more social mobility than previously because of the opportunities from wealth. But yeah, I want to stress that actually the, the owning of slaves, which is often uh, overlooked, was kind of important in my opinion. Uh, something that people just took for granted because most cultures all over the world have actually uh, had the concept of slavery up until very recent times. Anyway, so trade contacts, that's important, and uh, in general cultural contacts with uh, people even, or at least ideas from very long distances away, gave the opportunity to people to really think about new things and question uh, things like their own cultural uh, assumptions and preconceptions and sort of relativizing uh, their own cultural habits and beliefs and even religions. And in some of these city-states the governing was done sort of democratically. For example, famously Athens had a uh, so-called democratic government, where uh, basically all citizens who were born in Athens, uh, who were men and of uh, a ripe enough age, they were able to uh, participate in decision-making democratically. And that means they had to be able to convince other people, the masses, to do what they want. They needed to speak uh, to the masses in an effective way. And that requires uh, effective rhetoric. That is one of the things that sort of led to philosophy, as you will soon see. In this period, many different so-called schools of thought arose, especially materialism, idealism, skepticism and relativism. These are important strands of thought that continue throughout the history of philosophy. Other movements with philosophical thinking existed uh, in Asia, for example, but proper philosophical thinking developed in this specific area in throughout history in uh, so-called Western culture. These other uh, wisdom traditions didn't have a significant connection to this tradition of philosophy. Philosophical views were expressed in poetry, uh, especially in the beginning, and later also in dialogues, such as famously Plato's dialogues. And also, for example, in the case of Aristotle, uh, they were preserved as lecture notes. So there were perhaps more varied ways of expressing philosophy than there are in use now in academic philosophy. Of course, there was no academic philosophy before Plato. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, the amount and quality of the sources that we have now from this period, also from later periods, but especially from antiquity, these sources are very limited. And historians of philosophy often have to uh, rely on second-hand accounts, or even worse, like accounts made by opponents of a given philosophical uh, school or even a specific 
philosopher. The first philosophers, or possibly, you know, some might say these are not actually quite yet philosophers, but it's easier to just call them pre-Socratic philosophers. So these are philosophers who are known as pre-Socratic because they lived before Socrates. So uh, in this time, uh, from 6th century BCE onward, there was a transition in thinking from mythos to logos, so from mythical thinking to logical thinking, rational thinking. And uh, there are still not just signs of this, but actually mythical thinking is used pretty much, for example, by Plato even. So it's not just actually in pre-Socratic philosophy where mythos is going on, but this is more like a large cultural change that happened at this time. And famously, Ionian natural philosophy, so this is from the the area that is now that belongs to modern day Turkey. These Ionian natural philosophers especially tried to explain the metaphysics behind the observable reality. So to explain why the world is like this or what the world is fundamentally made of. That was what they were talking about. So the most famous of these Ionians was Thales or Thales from Miletus and he has been called the first of the seven wise ones. And he famously predicted the eclipse of 585 BCE, or according to the story anyway. Whether he actually predicted it or not, I think the point here is that uh, he knew about astronomy and probably practiced astronomy. He's not certainly the only one of these uh, natural philosophers to do that. His uh, most famous, most important idea was that everything is fundamentally made of water, or the first principle or arche is water. And later Anaximander, or Anaximandros, uh, also from Miletus, had clearly also some ideas about astronomy, and he, he thought that the Earth was actually something of a cylinder. So not a globe, but a cylindrical object. And his philosophical, metaphysical idea about the fundamental nature of reality is rather interesting, because for him it's not, the RK is not just some kind of material, tangible thing, but rather it is something he called to apeiron, the limitless or the infinite. So that's a very abstract idea and shows that these people were thinking in very abstract ways at this point already. Anaximenes, also from Miletus, sort of perhaps took a step back uh, in that he thought that the RK is air, but that air doesn't mean just this air. Here it uh, means breath and spirit as well. So take from that what you will. But anyway, that gives you some idea of what Ionian natural philosophers thought about. Then Pythagoras, most famous for his uh, geometrical stuff about uh, triangles especially. Uh, he originally was from Samos, but moved to Croton, which is in Magna Grecia, or Magna Grecia, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, and he was pretty interesting in that his followers, or he and his followers actually formed something of a cult. So that is something a bit strange. They had 
weird ideas, but they also gained a lot of political power. So until, you know, of course, people at some point turned against them. But anyway, for a time, they had a lot of political power, which is interesting in itself. But more importantly for philosophy or the history of philosophy is that uh, the idea that Pythagoras had was that the RK is not anything like uh, objects in the world or matter in that sense, but rather numbers. So he was very, uh, or seems like a very rationalistic person in that sense. But also this led to numerology and so weird ideas about the power of numbers and the meaning of numbers and whatever. He also had an idea, or it may have come from elsewhere, but anyway, it was important also that there is this idea of cosmos versus chaos. So an organized, beautiful, uh, structured reality versus this chaotic stuff. So numbers perhaps make uh, something like laws of nature or rules that create this cosmos out of chaos, something like that. Anyway, uh, if you play role-playing games, you may be familiar with something known as the Pythagorean solids, because you may have been using dice uh, that are those shapes, actually, that Pythagoras or his followers apparently figured out. Uh, he also is famous for the phrase or the idea, as above, so below, meaning that the soul as the microcosm is in harmony with the macrocosm, the large cosmos. And he is credited also with the first use of the term philosopher. So in that sense, some might say that philosophy begins with Pythagoras. Perhaps for the history of philosophy, it is most important that he greatly influenced Plato, as we will see later. In Ilia, which again is in Magna Grecia, uh, began another school of philosophy known as the Iliatics, um, no, the Ilian philosophers, the first of which is Parmenides, and he lives in 6th and 5th centuries BCE, so also very early. He also uh, practiced astronomy and figured out that the Earth is some kind of a globe. And he figured out that the morning star and the evening star are actually the same uh, object out there. We now call Venus. So he clearly was pretty proficient in astronomy. Mm, he made uh, significant distinctions in metaphysics and epistemology uh, between the appearances and reality, and uh, thought of reason or reasoning as the ability, the way to discover the truth. And again, these are things that greatly influenced Plato. He also thought that in reality, there is no such thing as change or movement or vacuum. So the whole of reality is actually uh, timeless, one and sphere. But remember that this is uh, the metaphysical reality and somehow he apparently was able to have these ideas where he completely thinks differently about this, like the real truth and what appears to be the case, because this one, this reality that is a sphere, is not the same as the globe 
the, that the Earth is, because in metaphysics he's talking about the whole of reality as being this one sphere, which is just a sphere because for some reason the Greeks thought that the sphere is the perfect shape. So it is fitting for it to be a sphere. Xenophanes is not always considered actually in the same school as Parmenides. He also lived in Elia and made an important criticism against the gods or the theology, if you will, of the ancient Greeks, where the gods were thought of as these anthropomorphic uh, entities. This perhaps actually is rather the gods of the elite, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Anyway, you probably know about this Zeus and uh, Hera and whatever, all these gods and goddesses who are described as anthropomorphic. And Xenophanes thought that uh, this is ridiculous, that all peoples create their own gods in their own image. <laughs> and I think he also thought that, you know, if donkeys had gods, those gods would look like donkeys and so on. But he wasn't actually an atheist. Rather, he thought that uh, this kind of anthropomorphic god talk is uh, not uh, respectful, perhaps, um, and that a real god would be an abstract single god, uh, one of Arche this single principle, whether a thinking entity or not. Zeno, also of Ilia, uh, was a follower of Parmenides, and he devised logical paradoxes to prove that the views of Parmenides are true. And you probably have heard of the story of Achilles and the Tertus, or the arrow, and other paradoxes, which later have been shown to not be quite <laughs> as valid or convincing as they may have seemed at the time. Moving on to Heraclitus, who thought that logos, meaning arche or reason or measure or moral norm, is the central concept in philosophy or his thinking anyway. He thought that the arche or soul of the world is fire. He also thought that the cosmos is composed of a unity of opposites, which kind of sounds like the yang yin sort of thing. He is famous for some <laughs> sentences like pantare, everything is in flux. Uh, and his views can be seen as uh, completely the opposites of Parmenides, who thought that there is no change and everything is just this one thing. So Heraclitus is saying that everything is actually in flux, in constant change, you cannot step into the same river twice, that sort of things. Uh, and there's not even just one thing, although there is this one uh, principle of fire. Then Empedocles, he himself may not be known to you unless you actually read something about the history of philosophy before, but it is almost certain that you have heard of his theory of elements because he had this idea of four elements of earth, water, air and fire. That instead of any one arche there are now four different uh, basic elements or roots uh, reside uh, that everything is composed of. And there are also two uh, principles, love and strife, that either join these roots together or tear them apart. And this is how different entities are made by the action of these two principles on those elements. And that idea of the four elements really stayed very long in 
Western thought. In Eastern thought, there's a similar idea. For example, in Chinese ancient thinking, but let's not go there. And Anaxagoras, who actually uh, moved from Ionia to Athens, and some might say sort of brought philosophy to Athens, he denied the divine nature of astronomical objects because at the time people had thought that looking up at the night sky you could see all these uh, different objects and think of them as somehow the gods or their some kind of manifestation or whatever but Anaxagoras uh, denied this and pretty much for this was banished from Athens. He also understood and described how lunar eclipses work. So again, another Ionian who practices astronomy. And he had an interesting metaphysical idea, a pluralistic metaphysics, where he didn't give an exact number, but stated that there are there's a huge number of elements that are spread all over, uh, so that there is a bit of all of these elements in everything. So, the tiny particle or drop will include the whole cosmos in itself, in a way. And also that reason rules everything, the whole universe. That there is some kind of cosmic reason. Then there are two important atomists, Leokippus and Democritus. These guys are responsible for one of the most important basic ideas that have survived throughout history. Again, until the very recent times, the idea that the universe is actually a vacuum with particles in it and particles that are indivisible. So basically if you chop down this piece of paper into smaller and smaller bits, there will be a time when you can no longer uh, split a particle into smaller particles. And that is because the particles that you found were the smallest that there are, what the whole universe is made of. And these are called atoms because they are atomos, uh, indivisible. So the idea was that these atoms, which I think were of different sizes, but anyway they were uh, eternal in the sense that you couldn't destroy them. They had always been there and they would always be there. But the vacuum is necessary for uh, the possibility of movement. So these atoms move in the world, in the vacuum. And they sort of clump up into <laughs> various objects. So this was the kind of uh, pre-Socratic thinking that much of that was natural philosophy. and. Then there were sophists uh, from the 5th century BCE onwards who were these people. The word sophist actually just means teacher. But anyway, um, the difference between the sophists and some of these earlier mentioned philosophers is that these teachers were ordinary people, uh, at least compared to these uh, some of these natural philosophers and others who founded cults or were hermits perhaps or otherwise kind of weird individuals. But these teachers were sort of ordinary people who lived and uh, worked among the ordinary people. And importantly, of course, worked as teachers, not in the sense that we now may understand what a teacher is, but 
at this time uh, these were people especially important uh, for teaching rhetoric if you remember I mentioned that rhetoric was important to sway public opinion in your favor in these democracies for example so a lot of uh, sophists traveled around uh, and taught people for money uh, so that they uh, themselves made a living and promised to be able to teach people to convince the masses to do what they want. And perhaps because of their profession, they were more interested in humans and focusing on humans rather than metaphysics or natural philosophy. And they taught many other skills as well, even like sword fighting or you know other skills. They were that teachers, not just teachers of rhetoric, but teachers of various skills. Usually, I suppose, mostly teaching one skill, but perhaps several. And they were uh, often relativists or and more skeptics um, because probably they saw that things are not quite as simple and clear cut as people had been uh, accustomed to thinking in the past. And this was also one of the things that really are important for the beginning of philosophy. This realization that things are not perhaps as they seem, as we are used to thinking. Uh, they had two important concepts, nomos, by which they meant man-made law, and thesis, by which they meant nature. And they had different views about government, such as uh, the idea that might is right or might makes uh, right. The idea of social contract as well, that people are building these uh, poli, these cities, uh, and creating societies because it is better than to just try and survive on your own. That sort of ideas. Uh, among the most famous of these, or perhaps the most famous of these sophists, is Protagoras. His most famous phrase is homo mensura, as translated in Latin, and can be translated as uh, man is the measure of all things, and has been understood in many different ways, meaning perhaps, for example, that an individual themselves is like the measure of everything, so perfect relativism or whatever. But there have been other understandings of this phrase. Anyway, he has uh, been considered a proponent of relativism by claiming that any question can be approached from a, a different opposite viewpoints. So absolute truth is un unattainable and therefore all opinions are equal, which kind of sounds silly, but anyway, he has been claimed to have thought that way. And uh, perhaps importantly, he thought that even uh, the existence of gods cannot be known. There were other sophists, but I'll skip them because I already explained their basic ideas or what is known about them. And now we can get into the golden age of Greek philosophy, uh, the Socratics, which actually refers to just three philosophers, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, from 5th century BCE to the end of 4th century BCE in Athens. These guys are the reason why people probably still associate philosophy mostly with Athens. And I have been calling these the great trio. These philosophers emphasized ethics and later also knowledge, but 
Socrates especially focused on practical uh, living, uh, perhaps, and some ethical ideas, perhaps more than anyone before him, and perhaps also more than these others. So Socrates is the teacher of Plato, who was the teacher of Aristotle. Socrates himself never wrote anything. He thought actually that writing is uh, detrimental uh, to the memory because people could just read stuff <laughs> instead of memorizing stuff. So yeah, or well, maybe he had some truth in that. Somehow claimed that Socrates wasn't a real person or that there are no sources or that the existence of historical Socrates is uh, as uncertain as the existence of historical Jesus. But this is not true because his contemporaries Aristophanes, Plato and Xenophon, uh, for example, perhaps others as well, wrote about Socrates already, which is, well, something you can't say about Jesus. Uh, Socrates had to drink poison eventually because he was accused of corrupting the youth and being impious, uh, which he denied, but he failed to defend himself and so was condemned to death. He has been called the father of philosophy and he was known for his uh, critical thinking. Uh, he referred to, to himself as a gadfly, for example, and he claimed that if he was wise, it was because he did not claim to be wise. He didn't claim to know something he did not in fact know. That sort of thing shows his critical thinking, and that's important for the history of philosophy again. And he questioned everything, or the obvious anyway. His method of philosophy, of philosophizing, was dialogue. He talked to a lot of people and probably pissed off a lot of them. And he also thought of himself as a midwife because of this method that he was using, that he was allowing or enabling, helping the other person to give birth to the wisdom or truth that might emerge through this Socratic dialogue. He claimed he didn't know anything, but he sort of did actually still seem to have some opinions about things, uh, like that the goal of life is eudaimonia or eudaimonia uh, or happiness, and it requires wisdom. And he seems to have thought that knowing what is right will also sort of make you to do what is right, which is kind of counterintuitive, perhaps. And he also famously said that philosophy is preparing for death. He was critical of the sophists who claimed to be wise, to have some wisdom, to know stuff and to be able to teach them. And he was also critical of them for taking money for teaching. Socrates seems to have had an idea of coping without knowing stuff, which I think is an important part of philosophy. His most famous student, and some might say the most important philosopher of all time, is Plato. And whereas Socrates never wrote anything, Plato wrote a lot. And his dialogues, because he wrote dialogues, uh, also survive. And because they have been preserved so well and, you know, copied and apparently all of them survive, his influence has been great in Western, not just philosophy, but Western culture in general. And because these texts were considered so good that they were copied uh, so that they survived history, <laughs> um, they have had a lot of influence 
far more influence than anything before him on Western thought. And he sort of creates philosophy as it can be understood these days, because he, in a way, uh, created a complete philosophical system where he covered all the basic branches of philosophy, talked about all of them, although it's not a systematic philosophy in the sense, well, this might be argued, but anyway, it might not be a, intended as a philosophical system as it was considered afterwards, but rather perhaps he meant it as a work in progress. He created dialogues to sort of think, perhaps <laughs> while writing it, which is what philosophers and other academics do as, as their research. Writing is thinking. In fact, I'd say it's far better to think by writing than to just think in your head. Plato famously, or importantly, uh, founded the Academy, which is where words like academic come from, uh, which was closed by Emperor Justinian in 529 CE. So it lasted for more than 800 years. Philosophically, Plato's most important uh, contribution was idealism, a form of rationalism. His idea was that <laughs> uh, there are ideas which are real, they are universals, uh, meaning that they are universal concepts, and uh, the observable world, like with Parmenides, is just appearances, it's not the fundamental reality. The fundamental reality is the realm of these ideas. And before birth, uh, the souls of people uh, have actually been in contact with these ideas, which is why they actually already know the ideas. And when they are born into life, they can uh, recall anamnesis, uh, these ideas, through the use of reason. So he had an idea of a cycle of rebirths, which often is kind of glossed over, I think. He uh, explained his thinking in the cave metaphor, which is explained everywhere. I have already made a video about that as well, so I'm not gonna repeat that. In his book known as The Republic, he had this idea, again, of historical importance of this state republic, uh, which is led by philosophers and has a three-caste system where there are philosophers on top, then there are guards and uh, workers at the bottom, and the guards and the philosophers who rule are not allowed to uh, have children and, like the guards, also are not allowed to have any personal property. In uh, science, Plato had this important idea of saving the appearances, which means that uh, there is this idea that behind how the world appears, there are laws or invariances and to explain what's going on you create a model that saves the appearances, that uh, creates the same observations that you see out there in actual reality. Um, and Plato's student Aristotle, uh, who was the teacher to Alexander the Great. He was a hugely influential philosopher as well, in ways perhaps more important than Plato. For the history of science, he is the most important philosopher, at least from antiquity. 
because he created actually uh, founded many of the sciences perhaps most important at least for philosophy uh, he also among those sciences included logic uh, and uh, syllogisms as a form of logic which were very much used throughout the Middle Ages, for example. He had uh, an idea, again, very influential for a very, very long time uh, in sciences about the causes of things, because he had this idea that there are four causes that are used to explain things. Uh, there's the material cause, uh, for example, the clay. Uh, there's the formal cause, uh, for example, the shape of a wine jar. And there's the efficient cause, which is the potter, or perhaps more specifically, the potter's knowledge of making wine jars. And the final, or teleological, and historically more importantly, this teleological uh, reason, the purpose uh, that the potter actually has of creating containers for selling. So to explain fully why there are wine jars, you can use all these four courses and all of them explain something about why there are these jars. But importantly, the teleological reason, which is also used in explaining why, for example, if I lift a book and let it go, why it falls down. It is strange to us, but it also involves the teleological reasoning. Uh, while perhaps in things like physics, it later turned out to be counterproductive as an explanation in biology. It was um, probably very useful for a very long time. And of course, for understanding human action, there is no better explanation probably than teleological explanations. People have purposes. They do things for a reason. He had uh, also this idea of the good life, the eudaimonia, but his uh, idea of how to achieve this, which by the way is something that can only be said afterwards, sort of a person's life as a complete life, once it's over, then can be said to be either good or not so good. But he was a conservative and... Uh, he thought that uh, the most important thing is what he referred to, or has at least been referred to as the golden mean. It's actually the idea of moderation, which sounds reasonable, at least at first, if you think about it. For example, drinking a little bit of wine uh, with dinner, for example. So drinking in moderation may be pleasurable and might have some benefits even. Uh, drinking too much, it's not such a good idea. And weirdly, not drinking at all, also not a good thing in that cultural context anyway, I suppose. Not having like easy access to potable water, perhaps, <laughs> or not taking part in a important social activity, such as the meal with other people. The idea is that between extremes there is always the good middle road which is supposed to be where the happiness or whatever is to be found, uh, which actually kind of sounds like the middle ground fallacy, doesn't it? He thought that virtue is again in the middle and there are virtues that you need to uh, learn to instill in yourself and then you will more easily live virtuously. So you will live 
well and why is this? it's like living in extreme ways so avoid extremes and you'll be fine he founded another school like Plato had founded Academia or whatever Aristotle founded Lucaeon or Lyceum and his uh, school is actually often called the peripatetic school because there was the idea that Aristotle used to walk and talk, you know, teach while walking, which is perhaps not actually true, but it doesn't matter, the name stuck. He did not agree with Plato, but clearly was influenced by Plato. But whereas Plato's ideas had been somewhere in a supernatural reality, Aristotle thought that there's something similar, which I will call forms, which are in the things themselves, so in this immanent reality, this world. So there's no other world, there's just this world, and there's matter, hule, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, and the forms shape this matter and give it important qualities, I suppose. Uh, a form has always its telos and potential, that's another important term. Things actualize their potential. So, you know, an acorn grows into a, an oak tree, because the acorn already has the potential to grow into the oak tree. If given nutrients and water and place to grow, it will grow into that that sort of idea because he used to uh, analyze a lot of things and categorize things and he thought that uh, things have their accidental and specific uh, or necessary properties specific meaning you know from the species so things are of a certain species so they have properties they have to have certain properties or generally have these certain properties like human is a rational animal also a political animal but anyway a rational animal meaning that humans in general have this ability to use reason to think rationally and that is what makes humans humans i suppose he knew that not everyone is rational and Practically no one is always rational, but we have the ability, at least as a species, to be able to reason. Uh, and his uh, worldview, I think, was quite kind of a <laughs> pretty, uh, and it was it was pretty much the same worldview until Copernicus. So the idea was that the Earth is in the center of the universe and around it are these crystalline spheres made of the fifth element, quintessence. Quintessence meaning fifth element. Uh, they are crystalline in the sense that they, you can see through them and they are uh, so basically, if you look outside and look at the stars in the sky, you are actually looking through all these different spheres. So there's the sphere of the moon, the lunar sphere, for example, and then there are these other stars, and there are in fact 59 spheres, until finally there is this sphere of these... Uh, uh, stars, the immovable stars. Anyway, beyond them, I think he thought that there's the uh, unmoved mover, the uh, primum immobile in Latin, the first mover or god, also, which the Christians, of course, like to hear when they came across Aristotle's writing, 
but actually uh, for Aristotle there were 55 of these to account for the movement of the stars so maybe not so nice for the Christians but anyway Aristotle's ideas were very uh, useful uh, they were eventually acceptable to Christians so his thinking very much influenced the whole of medieval uh, thinking academic thinking if you will so much that uh, the medievals talked about the philosopher and referred to Aristotle that way it kind of shows how important this one guy was and this kind of ends the classical period and we now enter the Hellenistic period and the Roman era then afterwards sometimes these are uh, considered separate but anyway uh, the, the Hellenistic period so, so it begins with um, the Macedonian Empire Alexander the Great uh, conquers pretty much most of the known world uh, known to the Greeks anyways and that is where the Hellenistic period begins and it ended in 146 BC so that was 323 BC uh, to 146 BC when Rome in turn conquered the well the Greek speaking area then the Roman era is thought to end in 5th century CE this can also be called late antiquity in this time for example the Greek science flourished uh, there could be many examples that I could add here but I'll just mention Euclid the famous writer of the elements the founding stone of um, geometry if you will so in his book he presented geometry as an axiomatic system and I think it was only in like late 19th or early 20th century when people realized that there actually can be and need to be different geometries as well so other axiomatic systems of geometry for example to be used in navigating or sending missiles over long distances because the earth is actually round you know so flat uh, geometry isn't that useful you need to account for the roundness of the earth so that the sum of the angles of a triangle is more than 180 Aristarchus of Samos was an astronomer who probably was the first to come up with heliocentrism the sun-centered worldview which unfortunately didn't catch on he may also have be the person to first calculate pretty accurately things like the size of the earth and the distance of the sun maybe things like that but I'm not sure Archimedes the famous mathematician and engineer who died in the fighting of Syracuse this Hellenistic period is known as the Hellenistic because it is the time when Greek-speaking culture and Greek culture spread all over a very, very wide area and the former city-states lost their political meaning or significance uh, I mean, in the sense that they didn't have that much power uh, but also Alexander did found a lot of these big cities many of which are called Alexandria so the city culture lived on in some ways but they no longer were independent uh, cities like they had been in the classical period this whole change of the world and losing independence these kind of things uh, might be a reason why certain philosophy schools became very popular and the focus of philosophy 
perhaps became the search for a peace of mind rather than some abstract knowledge of the world in general. Interestingly, while Greek culture spread all over the world and Rome then conquered almost all of this same area and conquered this Greek speaking world, Rome at the same time was sort of conquered by Greek culture. So that the Roman elites, for example, spoke Greek from then on, which you don't actually unfortunately see in movies, you know, dramas, whatever, about uh, Roman life, because, you know, if the actors all speak English, it doesn't make sense. But in reality, the elites spoke Greek amongst themselves, while the ordinary Romans spoke Latin. Which is why, by the way, the Latin Bible is known as Vulgata, the common language Bible, book, Biblia Vulgata. Uh, the Roman Empire, first it was the Republic, then it was uh, the Empire, was at its height from about 22 BCE to about 300 CE. A fairly long time anyway. But what were these uh, philosophy schools that I mentioned? They pretty much all of them taught uh, ways to achieve this peace of mind. I'll start with skepticism. There were many famous skeptics. But I think I'll just mention two. Pyrrho of Elis, whose school of uh, skepticism is known as Pyrrhonism, and Sextus Empiricus. The idea of this kind of skepticism was that because we cannot achieve certainty, we can never attain certainty. Therefore, we can really know nothing, which seems pretty strange if really understood as that. It might not actually be, you know, a lot of them actually thought, it seems, that more sensibly, that we just don't have certainty, but we have probable knowledge, which is pretty commonsensical, if you ask me. The idea was that because we cannot know anything with certainty, we should refrain from making judgments. They called they had this concept epoche for this. This was the way to attain ataraxia or peace of mind, literally meaning ataraxia. So ataraxia would be like being shaken. So ataraxia is not to be shaken. So whatever happens in the world, it doesn't like cause you PTSD or something. This was the way to get to eudaimonia or happy life. They made tropes or lists of ways to prove that absolute knowledge is impossible. And interestingly, they included uh, even what we might now call deductive logic. They would say that it, even that doesn't actually give us certainty. For example, the common example of deductive reasoning goes as follows. One, Socrates is a human. Two, all humans are mortal. Therefore, three, Socrates is mortal. And most people would think that this sort of knowledge gives us certainty. But the skeptics pointed out that we can't actually know that the premise all people are mortal is true. Because, you know, Socrates, if he's still alive, he hasn't died. <laughs> we will all only know that all people are mortals after all people have died. And that hasn't happened, so we don't really know that is that it will be the case. So they even questioned deductive logic. Skepticism was actually dominant in Plato's Academy from about 200 BC onward. And much later also sort of was revived. But this is perhaps not exactly 
what usually is thought about when people talk about skepticism these days they will be talking about what would better be called scientific skepticism but that's a whole other story there was a school or i'm not sure if this actually country as a school of thought but eclectics Cicero, Cicero is the most prominent thinker of that style. Uh, he was a Republican Roman, so against Kesa. And he took from skepticism and stoicism especially. The idea of eclecticism is to choose uh, the best from wherever you find it. So that's what eclectic means. So perhaps uh, because of the influence of skeptical arguments, it seemed sensible for people to just pick whatever works. But there were these other schools that had more specific ideas of what people really should do, like cynics or cynicism, for example, Diogenes of Sinope. He and other cynics thought that the goal of life or what makes people happy is autarkeia or self-sufficiency, being able to rule yourself in a way. And this again might remind you of some Eastern thinking. The idea is to not just enjoy everything, it is a form of hedonism, but anyway the idea is to not need or want things too much, like discard uh, unnecessary possessions just if you get by with less then why have too much it's just gonna be a burden so it's interesting and i think it's one of those things a ways of thinking that should be revived in the present while we still can serenacism is a form of hedonism as well and it was replaced by epicureanism named for epicurus his thinking was based on atomism and hedonism. I already explained atomism, but based on that, the idea was that since we are made of these atoms, and these atoms will dissipate at some point when I'm dead, I won't be around anymore when I'm dead. So I think they said something like, when I'm alive death is not there and when i'm dead uh, i won't be there or something like that so basically that death is nothing to be afraid of so there's nothing to worry about in death of course uh, the process of dying might be another thing but this uh, epicureanism is uh, spiritual or prudent kind of hedonism as well like compared to some other forms of hedonism where just enjoyment is the, the goal but here the goal is uh, peace of mind uh, from not just enjoying again let's use the example of wine you might enjoy drinking wine but if you drink too much wine you will suffer for it you will have a hangover so be sensible about what you do, be prudent, but enjoy life anyway. One of the most important schools of thought that had the most lasting influence in history is Stoicism. It lasted from the 4th century BCE to 3rd century CE, so that's already a long time, but also uh, even afterwards it had a great influence on Christianity and it included important famous uh, people like Seneca the Younger and Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, the idea of Stoicism is it's very different from uh, any kind of hedonism in that the Stoics pretty much <laughs> avoided pleasure almost and now you can see how it influenced Christianity or was attractive to Christians anyway. Uh, they thought that only virtue is good and only virtue brings happiness. Nature requires certain things like you have to eat, for example, to stay alive, so you eat enough to stay alive. And that's 
all well and good. But instead of uh, trying to find enjoyment, to find pleasure in the world, what they thought was that you need to be unaffected by uh, emotions or especially uh, passions or you know strong affects because those are the things that like shake your mind if you will so you need to reach apatheia not being shaken by these emotions so they respected reason a lot and downplayed emotions a lot the idea therefore was to be free of emotions essentially and they really thought that the way to do this was to suppress and control their emotions um, they also thought that the cosmos is a thoroughly rational organism um, that there are cosmic cycles that uh, sort of like the history of the world repeats itself and there's also always the final burning where the world ends in flame and then it gets reborn and everything repeats itself the same way so everything is predetermined actually and this means that there's no point in trying to fight your fate just accept it rather and live your role in life contently and then you can be happy another uh, school of thought that had a great influence among christians was neoplatonism started by plotinus and this was uh, the kind of thinking that combined mysticism with platonic ideas so in uh, neoplatonism it's not the same as platonism kind of important to separate those uh, in neoplatonism there is the idea of the one again uh, which emanates and causes everything to exist through these emanations there are different levels of reality and it's a really mystical structure but an, a philosopher or I would say a believer can get to know this through an internal contemplation or meditation maybe you can reach an ecstatic union with the one and interestingly this one uh, does not actually have a consciousness or self-awareness so it's not the kind of God that Christianity has but anyway this was a view that was pretty popular among Christians although one famous uh, Neoplatonist was Hippatia who was uh, killed by a bunch of fanatic Christians things are always a bit complicated in history during this time religions influenced philosophy and vice versa various mystic cults for example were popular in the roman empire and christianity was one of them and became the most popular and eventually the only accepted religion in the roman empire so that was about the end of the first century when it was developed and in 313 christianity became one of the religions and accepted in the roman empire and then by the end of the 300s it became the only acceptable religion so this means even philosophical views that uh, question the reality of god for example are kind of dangerous because you might be seen as a traitor to the empire or whatever christianity was influenced by manichaeism where the idea of the dichotomous battle between good and evil light and darkness came from or at least strongly influenced that part of christianity saint augustine was one of the early neoplatonic 
Christians who, for example, took from Manichaeism also the idea that the, the spirit is far more important than the body, pretty much completely focusing on the spirit. He also had this idea of philosophy of history, where the, the whole of history is really kind of like a theater play between man and God. This uh, brings us to the end of the late antiquity and the whole of antiquity. And in the next video, it's time for the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and Reformation. See you there. If you wish to support my channel, please click thumbs up, subscribe and share my videos. Any comments on the videos would also be welcome.